All right. Habits of mind, ensuring student success in general and general education courses is today's topic, and we have two fantastic uh, speakers. Um, there were five speakers in the last session, and uh, we have two today uh, only that will allow me to maybe just read the titles. The accomplishments and, uh, are many, uh, plenty of people. Um, so, uh, 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 Julia uh, Bossard is an uh, associate uh, professor of history, uh, PhD is from uh, University of Texas at Austin. Uh, so is Chris. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, maybe the, um, one of the late and exciting developments is uh, that Julia is the, the newest dean, uh, associate dean for research in the College of uh, Humanities and Social Sciences. So, that is, that is great news. Um, Chris um, uh, is uh, here as a temporary assistant uh, professor uh, of this is it, US history, history of sexuality, and history of psychology. So, a wonderful uh, span of a fascinating We were waiting to get a third line. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah so you had to see yeah. you had to make the real small font size. <laughs> 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 but at the point where it becomes Inaccessible. Yeah. <laughs> um, both are award-winning uh, educators. Uh, 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 um, engaged, ethically engaged in scholarship about teaching and learning. So we're looking forward to today's presentation. I understand that we will likely have time uh, at the end, uh, possibly up yeah, to. 15 minutes for conversation, which is wonderful at the end of the day to re energize uh, us. And so we are looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Doris. Well, and thank you all for coming to this last session of the day. Um, especially on a summer day and at what what time is it even three o'clock? Yeah. Um, Chris and I are going to talk to you today a little bit about some assignments that we have implemented into our general education courses. Both Chris and I teach our largest enrollment surveys in history. We wear that badge with a big pride of honor um, there that we do this. And we interact with a lot of students through general education. So we want to talk a little bit about habits of mind, which are just a couple of skills-based strategies that we have learned with. Over the past two years, Chris and I have developed online asynchronous courses, working especially with the learning strategists in the provost's office to integrate a lot more skills-based content into our classes with this. And we feel like it's made a really big difference. Instead of just feeling like we moved to online emergency remote instruction, we feel like we've created courses online that are really impactful to our students. And we want to go over, I think, a few examples of that to really help you try to think about how are some ways that if I teach a general education course, how can I think about implementing some of these skills with the content? We're all excellent content experts, right? That's why we're here. But what can we give to our students in those general education courses? So I'm going to talk a little bit about what habits of mine are. And you have a handout, and on the back is just this chart with 16 different habits of mine. And we're going to return to this later, but I kind of want to walk through what this is, what this concept is, and how, uh, kind of how I've thought about it over the time that I've been an educator. So here we have kind of this chart from Dweck from 1981, before some of us were born, but it's still very useful. And it's about integrating skills with content. And so the assignments and practices that we have in our course, in our general education courses, really help develop the academic and social skills necessary for students to become independent, entrepreneurial, and also reflective in both their college and hopefully their eventual uh, careers as well. And so here you can see a bunch of things that we might do kind of automatically or think about, but Julie and I think that it's important to move from kind of the automatic, kind of just doing it, to being very intentional about it. And that's a word that you probably hear us say quite a bit, is being intentional about it. So uh, if you were in the last presentation about ungrading, you know, they talked a lot about persisting and, and having students keep on going. And here you can see that's the first of these 16. But things like managing impulsivity, not writing the first answer that comes to mind, thinking deeply, right? Lins listening and understanding with empathy. This is extraordinarily important for the historical discipline, both Julia and my discipline, because a core tenet 
is historical empathy, thinking about what people in the past were experiencing and why they made the actions that they did. So here you can see how some of it starts to become also easy to incorporate within specific disciplines too. Um, one that I want to kind of point out, so uh, one thing that we haven't said is I started education at a second chance boarding school. I lived on campus with the boys. Uh, it was all boys. They had all been kicked out of their previous school for either academic, not reaching their academic success, or also for drug problems. So uh, it was the hardest but possibly best job of my life. Ravi, no offense to what you've provided me here. Um, but uh, I, I kind of got an introduction there and uh, to habits of mind and thinking about persisting and whatnot. And it kind of was always in the back of my mind and when I taught at a different place and I taught teaching methods, I remembered this thing I had never done, which is gathering data through all senses. It's like, oh, how could I actually actualize this? And when I was teaching a class on uh, gender history and how to teach it, I had students, I, I have no clue how I convince anyone to fund most of what I want to do. Uh, I got the department to pay for all of my students to go to a Yankees game. And so we all traveled up to a Yankees game, and they had to think this about. This is Connecticut, by the way. No, this oh. is no, this is at Teachers College. Oh, sorry. So this is New York City. Um, so we traveled up uh, to the Bronx from the Upper West Side, and the students had to observe and write a paper about the public display of gender at a sports element. And I told them not to only think about what they were seeing and hearing, but what they were smelling. And somebody wrote the coolest paper, and I don't think I've ever told you this, the coolest paper about the smell of the hot dogs uh, and how that would, like played into the gendered line and all the men waiting for hot dogs were, or all the people waiting for hot dogs were men. So keeping all the senses there worked for a history class. I know that sounds like maybe the coolest or the weirdest assignment you've ever heard about, but it was awesome reading those papers. So, you know, this chart is really, I think, important because you can look at it, you can be like, what do I wanna push myself to do that could bring out uh, the full learning experience, the full experience of students too? And, you know, if you keep it kind of there, uh, you never know what's gonna come to mind and you never know if you're gonna read a paper about hot dogs. Uh, <laughs> so, but, other things you know, that we can always keep in mind, you know, finding humor, uh, even in uh, serious disciplines, it's always important for things like that. But then things that I think we do kind of automatically, but we could be more intentional about it, including thinking interdependently. So you can see how all of this starts um, coming into play. And while this is a 16 point framework that we put in front of you, we've seen them all the way up to 32. And these typically have been used in K through 12 classrooms. But I think as you're looking at this matrix, I think you can agree that we do a lot of these things in our teaching already. And how can we think about how to integrate these a little bit more? You might also be looking at it and thinking to yourself, what are some of the deficiencies that my students have come to the classroom with? especially in the past two years. I think that we've seen an exacerbation of learning loss in the past two years of unpreparedness when we're thinking about how are students prepared academically and socially to meet the rigors that college level education provides. There's a lot of work that we have to do to get our students up to that idea. So when we're thinking about habits of mind, those were all 16 great ideas, but why do this? Well, as you can see here, our little friend, the brain, we need to encourage our students, just like how they build their muscles, to build that most important muscle, their brain. And there are really four themes that we thought about in terms of habits of mind assignment can do four very important things in terms of learning for our students. The first is to create a sense of equity. Are equality and equity the same thing? No, right? Equity is about creating a level playing field. I want you to think back to your general education courses. How many different levels of students did you have in there? Can you identify them for me? Maybe you had first year students, right? What are some other examples of students who might be taking general education courses? I don't know their major yet. Exploratory students, right? Who else? 
Last semester before graduation. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's my favorite demographic sometimes because they're like, I could care less that I am here. All right? Who else? Freshmen. Who else? Check a box. They don't care, right? Yeah. I've had students come right up to me and be like, I hate history. And I'm like, cool, thanks so much for telling the professor that. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly, I'm sure you've heard the same thing. Yeah. Who else is in there? What about our returning students? Those who have maybe taken some time off, come back. We have a large missionary population here, so returning missionaries. We have a lot of people who leave college for various reasons, come back later in life to complete. My favorite demographic of students who take my gen ed courses are the moms who left and now are coming back at the same time that their students, and their students are taking my class too, and they're always doing better <laughs> than their kid. I'm, maybe that's a FERPA violation, but. <laughs> This was about creating equity for our students too. These types of skills-based assignments, time management, thinking about what is a syllabus? Why is attendance important? These things that seem very common sense to us are not always common sense to our students, all right? We have various levels of preparation that have come in. Some, we just recently learned, Cache Valley doesn't necessarily give homework. So we have some students who don't know necessarily how to do independent work by themselves, they don't understand why the reading is important. They don't know what a syllabus is. Others, maybe they went to a private school and they had a private tutor who was always doing that work with them. Or my favorite example, the helicopter mom, right? Who's just kind of circling around, telling them what to do. So this is about creating a sense of equity, especially for our students from non-traditional backgrounds or not well-developed backgrounds. So how can we make sure that they have skills? The second, we're kind of thinking about this too, as a gen ed instructor, and I'm going to ask you this because you teach Gen Ed. How many times have your students asked you, when am I going to use this? What good is this to me? We teach history. They're like, no one's going to come up to you and be like, when was the Battle of Waterloo? Your raise depends upon me. Thank you. <laughs> Good job. Field trips. Yes. You are in the A for the day. So it's not necessarily that they're going to walk out of our class and use all of the content every day, but what can we give them as gen ed instructors? What can I allow them to have be a transferable academic skill? And I think about that in terms of this student may go on to be a vet science major or a di dietary major, or they may be a science major of some sort and never a historian. Hopefully they will be a historian. but. Right, Ravi, I said that, so. <laughs> so what are some of these transferable things that I can give to my students in their first class with me that they can carry on? And we've made sure very carefully here to think about not only the curriculum, but in their lives as well. How can I set them up to be a successful, really adult as well? How can I make sure that they have good time management skills? That also leads us into kind of our third category here and our third rationale, which is independence. We want to foster students who are independent, self-reliant learners. How do we have students who take responsibility for their learning? When they do poorly on an exam, it's not, well, Dr. Gosser doesn't like me, so she knocked me down. She, didn't, she gave me a C because she doesn't like me. Well, that's not taking responsibility. Also, I don't know you, so. <laughs> it's not that I don't like you. It's just you didn't do a good job. So instead, how can we teach them emphasis on self-reliance and taking responsibility for your work, being reflective, metacognitive in this way. And that's a really, I think, important skill, not only in your academic career, but in your life, as well as taking responsibility. And finally, kind of another one of those good academic skills, but also a good life skill, resilience. How can we teach our students that even though maybe they didn't do well on that first test, there's an opportunity to learn from that. There's an opportunity to keep going. How do we make sure that these students don't just shut down automatically? So these are kind of our four big ideas that help the brain to grow. I'm very proud of how this <laughs> illuminated. So this really helps the brain to grow, our students to grow as individual students through these skills-based assignments that we have here. So 
we're talk a little bit about our courses so you can understand how the assignments we're going to show you that we've incorporated into our classes work. So I have Habits of Mind assignments in History 1700, which is simply titled American History and is supposed to teach students all of American history because that's possible. Uh, <laughs> but it counts for our breadth American institution requirement, so that's one of our general education. It's online asynchronous, and usually we have 180 students in it, but our gracious uh, department head let me go down to 100 this fall, but we'll go back to up to 180. Uh, and it's a survey, like I said, from pre-colonial to today. Uh, I would mostly do 20th century, so there's a lot more 20th century, which the students actually really love. Um, the other thing to know about my classes, uh, instead of writing my book, which gave me trepidation and fear for the first two years I was here, I built what's called a choose your own grading adventure. Students accumulate points by completing assignments that range from a quiz attached to primary source readings, the lectures, I really want to reward them for doing the work, but then also they only have to earn 279 points for an A. There are currently 1,300 point options. So they have tons of range. They can go into something that they're most interested in. So for a simple kind of example, a lot of the female students will be like, thank you for teaching me about women's history. A lot of the LGBTQ students were like, I know that there were only 10 primary sources on this, but holy crap, I didn't know that like this was a field. Thank you so much for doing that. So uh, they can dive in on things that they're more interested in. And uh, it's been wonderful to read most of the feedback from students being like, I really got to learn a lot about things I was interested in. And if they ever email me, I'm like, we have a class in that. Please take another class and keep us all in business. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so it's a monstrous class that I've designed with the habits of mind class or assignments being one of the ways that they can earn points towards that A. For my class, which is uh, History 1110, which is European history from 1500 to quite literally the present, I actually put in things last semester about the war in Ukraine so our students could understand the context for this. I do Habits of Mind assignments as extra credit. I had never given extra credit before, but I found that was an opportunity for my students, the ones who maybe are struggling or need some intervention, and the ones who constantly ask me for extra credit. This is an easy way to do it. And I can say, we have some statistics about our assignments of who did what. The ones where they get to replace an assignment, or it's at least 10 points, they do more. So um, Karen, you said in one of your learning circles long ago, you said USU students don't do anything unless points are attached to them. And I would say we have um, quant quality, or quantitative data that definitely shows that. So all right. So this is kind of our first example that we're going to talk about briefly, and then we're going to kind of move from these examples to helping you think about some ideas. Yeah, so we're going to go uh, kind of, uh, I think, in reverse chronicle order of when these are actually assigned. It's very ahistoric for historians to do this. <laughs> but this is something that I have kind of near the end of the semester in my class about the Pomodoro technique for studying. If any of you have had to write a dissertation or anything, you might have learned this because you figured out that you could not sit down and write for four hours at a time, you needed a break, you needed to get your coffee, or in my case, the beer, because I was writing late at night in order to fuel the next steps of all of this. We have a graduate student in our department here, so he, he might have to do earmuffs on these things. But this is, yeah, but this is kind of at the end, because I want students to be thinking about the most stressful time of the semester for many of them, which is finals. I want them to experiment. So what I've done is I've created an assignment page, and you get screenshots of this, in which I ask them to think about their effective study habits and what they've done. And we link to this guy who's very popular on YouTube. He's like the academic geek or something, college geek, uh, who has really good short videos about how to study better and thrive in college. And they're a little nerdy, but I think the students really like them. We have a secretly nerdy student population. I don't know if you figure that out here. but um, So they watch this, and then they just answer three simple questions. So have you ever used this before? If so, how did it go? If not, how do you normally study? So once again, we're starting to make them think about how they normally go about doing their academic work 
And obviously that will then transfer, hopefully, for how they uh, do anything in their career. Then I asked them to pick, up, pick an upcoming assignment where they can do this and practice it and to then reflect upon it. And so uh, this is great. They don't always choose something from my class. So I actually learn a lot about USU and what everyone's assigning too, which is kind of like the secretly like really cool thing is learning all the awesome things other professors are doing that I can steal a little bit of too. So, um, and I do ask them to provide as much detail as possible. I keep this kind of loose um, for them. And then I asked them to think about upcoming assignments in the final weeks of the semester where they could use this for. So this is important previewing of the end of the semester for them. And an assignment like this, um, which I've built through Atomic Assessments, which is one of our plugins, can earn a student up to five points towards their 279 for an A probably takes them about, I would say, 10 minutes after they've kind of done it. But most students will say, I use the Pomodoro technique for four hours, and I finished that pesky English 1010 paper faster than I ever thought I would. And I had the timer to 25 minutes. Or if they've done this, they know that maybe 15-minute bursts are best for them. And I got it done, and now I'm not stressed, and I was stressed about it. So uh, this is a, a very successful, I think, habits of mind activity that the students have generally enjoyed. I did get one that was like, I know that this doesn't work for me, and I did it and it stressed me out. And my comment, I actually gave it a zero, and I know that might seem harsh, but my comment was, you can choose your grading adventure. Don't choose anything that stresses you out. <laughs> so, and I thought if I gave it a five because I felt bad, it wouldn't get the point across like, of you are trying to find your strengths too. You are trying to find how things work for you. Uh, I'm also from New England when we are just not unfriendly people up there. <laughs> so, uh, so if you think that I am just way too harsh by not giving credit, um, it's, it's really my parents' fault for where I was born. <laughs> So to give you a sense of how popular this one was, because this is one of our, our favorite ones and I think one of the most popular. So keep in mind, Chris has that choose your own grading adventure. So your numbers are going to be a little bit lower in comparison to mine where it's extra credit. Yours was 38 students chose to do this out of 174. And I had 119 out of 177 students choose to complete this. So our students really are doing these assignments, especially, I think, in my case, when this had five points associated with it on a major assignment, and they were doing it. And what was really cool about this is later on in midterm preparation, I have another assignment there for kind of preparing for a in-class midterm and then preparing for a take-home midterm. I saw students mentioning this as one of the study strategies that they had. So without prompting, there we had that. All right, I want to talk a little bit about one that's probably very familiar to all of you. If you teach connections, if you teach any sort of these ones, is the semester planning. This is a very straightforward one. It literally is giving them an empty calendar to plan out all of their assignments, not just in your course, in all of their courses, and asking them to make sense of it very early on in the semester. For them to see, because a lot of them coming from high school are like, score, I only have three hours of this class a week, whereas before I had five. And then they quickly realize, that extra time is so that I can do well. It's not for me to go watch Netflix or goof around with my friends or work my second or third job that I have. This is really time given to you. So I asked them to put all their assignment due dates as well as birthdays, family events, other important events that they might want to include in their religious services, exercise classes, time that they want to spend with their friends. So I initially give them just a month long calendar. And then I also give them the option too of having a week calendar where I say schedule out everything from the moment you wake up until the moment you go to sleep. Everything you could possibly imagine. Everything from brushing your teeth to going to class, walking to class, playing your video game that you would never really know that you're going to play, that's there so you can start to see what is in your schedule. How can you start to maximize your time? How can you really start to think about your obligations? The other things that this does for our students is our students tend to think in just kind of a one week process just okay this is what's due Friday they don't really look ahead this forces them early in the semester to look ahead and I tell them hey reach out to your professors early if you notice you have a lot of tests on one day they might allow you to work ahead slightly 
some of us who are nicer may grant an extension, right? I think that there's also technically a policy that if they have three tests on a day, they can reschedule one for earlier. So that's something, too, that we can share policy with them as well. So this is a pretty straightforward one, but it's very impactful to the students who do this one. And I actually have them revise it. I give them an opportunity to revise it halfway through the semester, and it's fascinating to see how much revision happens there because they've started to realize, oh, you assign reading, so I have to read. Oh, you assign you know, math problems, I have to do the math problems, I have to go to the science tutor center, right, that's there, they have to start building that in. And then I also have them do it three quarters of the way through the semester, which is really when you see the absolute panic set in that the semester is over and they've got to hustle to get the grade that they want. So this is something you can do at multiple times. Yeah, and we wanted to provide a content specific example too, uh, to show how you can think about habits of mind to fuel content understanding. So uh, if you've read any curricular theorists, you know that you should think about designing your course backwards, which I just not only think about the end goal that you hope that students can complete, but you're hoping and framing your curriculum around a set of essential questions. So I have created five essential questions for my uh, History 1700 class, and you can see they're about government and power, America's role in the world, economics and labor, women and gender, and civil rights. The women and gender also goes into the civil rights one too. Uh, so very large, expansive questions that we didn't put up here, um, but uh, they've been stolen by other professors with fancier titles. I can tell you that. They asked me to do that. And early on in the class, this is actually assigned in week three, I asked the students to start making connections between the lectures, the primary sources. There's also these really great five minute educational cartoon TED Talks that are history based that I've infused in the class. And I want them to go to what I call cheat sheets to start answering one of the guiding questions. So I do put all of the resources uh, under um, kind of in a list where I match up that resource or something in the class with one of the guiding questions and they can go into that. And the hope is that they can then start preparing or we can scaffold these really high point assignments. So these are two assignments that they can complete at three points in the semester, week six, week 12, and finals. It's one's a primary source reading grid, kind of the who, what, when, where, why of that. But the last box of this, they have to answer one of the guiding questions. Or I think the most popular history assignment ever, which is a history meme uh, creation where they make their own meme and the first part of the answer is explaining it to somebody who's never heard this history. So they have to be really descriptive so that person can answer it. And the second part is answering a guiding question. So Jace is our graduate student who actually graded these. Jace, what are your thoughts on the memes the students create? Uh, it, they're not the best memes I've seen, but they <laughs> So I think they're great because I'm old. <laughs> Jace is younger and has seen more memes. So, <laughs> so I, the students, the, you probably would say, really like this assignment. Oh, yeah. This is by far the one that most students do in the Choose Your Own Grading Adventure. And like, once a student does it one time, you'll see their name again and again. <laughs> and so we asked them to consult these cheat sheets from week two and three. And like anything, if you've taught multi an online course, Providing the links so they can find it is always super important. It's a simple thing. And just to pick three lectures and or primary sources. Doesn't matter with a combo. And then to just write four to six sentences to start making these connections. So that way I can, and usually I provide the feedback on this, and I can provide uh, suggestions of another source that they might want to read, especially if they are interested in completing one of these very high point assignments that they can do. So I get to see their understanding of content and they get feedback early on so that way they can hopefully do really well on something that they might want to do a couple weeks later. Chris, what I really like about this particular one is that this makes our students into very intentional learners and they're starting to see I think how classes are organized. A lot of our students, I think, imagine that we just give them random assignments and ran, and I, I would hope, because you're all at the ETE conference, that's not what you are all doing. <laughs> that there is an inherent logic to what we are assigning. And I think this makes that very clear to our students. 
they're seeing your inherent logic, but then they can go for, to my class and start to recognize, oh, I bet Dr. G is not just making up assignments for me to do. I bet that there's a clear logic that's here. And then they'll go to Karin's class and they'll say, you know, she's not just making me like run, you teach languages, I think, so run conjugations. There's like a clear reason why she's wanting, she wants me to learn the language, you know? So I think this is a great transferable skill there as well. I'm going to go through this one kind of fast so that we can have time for a discussion. I think my favorite assignment that I do, and one of the most popular, Chris, if you could look up the statistics on this one for my class, is one about growth mindset. I got this idea from Shelly Arnold when she sent out this video back in the fall of 2021 about growth mindset. And it really resonated with me because if there's one thing that I hear from students all the time, it's like, I'm not a history person, I'm a science person. And I kind of sat there and said, you know, I'm not a science person, I'm a history person. And then I realized that's really reductive. It's incredibly reductive to our students and it can make them be in this fixed mindset. And especially in an online environment where they don't get to see fellow classmates. They maybe aren't talking to them in true ways. Maybe they're talking on a discussion board, but they aren't like, hey, how did you do on that test? Do you think that this is boring, et cetera, right, that's there. They aren't seeing that learning isn't fixed. They aren't seeing the ways that people are trying. So this assignment asks them to pick two courses that they currently are taking or that they have taken in the past to reflect on why they think that they have a fixed mindset in that course. This is metacognitive for them. They're really thinking about how they have learned. Maybe it's that they don't like the subject. And that's perfectly fine. You don't have to like everything, right? But what are, moving beyond this, what are some ways that they can have action-oriented uh, ways to really start to change to more of a growth mindset, to recognize I can learn this, I can be successful, even if I'm not a history person in that way. And this is one of, I think, for me, as an online instructor where I don't see my students. This is where I see their personality come out. This is where I start to make a personal connection with my students. And they say, oh, I had this really horrible history teacher who all he did was talk about military battles and there was never any, you know, and maybe that's for other people that's like, I had this really awesome history teacher who all he did was talk about military battles, <laughs> right? One or the other that is there. But I get to get a sense of their personality and I can help them move beyond that. I can say, you know, I struggled with chemistry when I first took, I got an F when I first took chemistry. And you so, don't no, you don't. <laughs> so, you know, this is a way that I can make a connection with my student. With all of these, I want to emphasize that it's one thing to ask your students to do this reflection. It's another thing, though, for you as the instructor, you do have to interact back with them. You have to make comments back to them. You have to foster that sense of connection because otherwise they're just screaming this out into the ether. And while that's somewhat helpful, it's just journaling then. It's not actually doing anything important that's there. So to give you quantification, Julia had 177 students in the spring semester and 161 students did this for extra yeah. credit. Yeah. This was a big extra, this was 10 points on something. But still, it was that moment where students did that. And I will say, for the vast majority of them, I saw them making some progress with that. So those are some of our ideas that we wanted to share with you just to get your juices flowing. What we want to do for the next few minutes, I'm going to have Chris explain this part to you. Yeah, so I just want you to do something simple, which is to look at the chart, and hopefully it's, it's very readable in what you have in front of you, and pick one of these 16 things that you know you do kind of as par for the course, but think about how you might be more intentional about doing that in your classes or in when you're thinking about um, whatever your role is here uh, or elsewhere. So one that you know you do, but you want to be more intentional about it. And we'll share out our answers in a couple minutes. OK, does anyone want to get started with, with this? So something that you do uh, kind of natural, but you want to be a little bit more intentional. And you might just say kind of what class you're in so we can understand, or what, what you're teaching or instructing, so we can just kind of understand the context as well. Yeah. So what this one made me tell oh, right. Hello, I'm Jacob. I teach an intro level uh, human development family studies class. 
Um, so there's around 112 students in the course, and it's in person. Um, and so every class period, we do a think pair share activity. And so the two skills that I'm like, man, I could really bring those in more, more directly is the taking responsible risks, because it is a risk to share your opinion, uh, and to talk with someone else who you may not know very well. Um, and then thinking interdependently, because a lot of them build on each other, like based on what this person said, how does this theory weave in? Um, but yeah, I think, I think I could be much more intentional with trying to facilitate that. Yeah, and I think, I think those are excellent examples of things you probably do a little, you know, you're doing naturally, and, but once you take a step back, right? Uh, responsible risk is something that my Choose Your Own Grading Adventure really allows. You know, uh, how many of you read academic articles in high school? I know I read zero. It's really tough. And I have lots of students who I really help with that process. I grade almost all of those, if not all of those. And the students might not do well on the first one, but they come back for more because they're like, this guy's actually going to teach me how to do this. And he's somewhat nice about it. Um, doesn't mean that they get a great grade, because once again, they can always keep on doing more and more. They're never really punished. But so many, I had one student at the Blanding campus who's like, I've never done these got something like 33% on the first one, did every single article analysis, earned 560 points, which is two ways. I couldn't give him six credits for the course. But he's just like, no one else is going to teach me this, and you're teaching me this, so I'm going to keep on doing that. If there is not a more heartening under, like, example of good education and a student doing a lot of these themselves, better than I, 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 that was like, like, it made me feel good uh, about what I was doing with that student. I think your example there, Jacob, you're Jacob, right? Okay. I was like, maybe I just made up the name. But <laughs> I think there, too, with this responsible risk-taking, it could be great at the beginning of your, your think, pair, share, where you talk about how important it is to hear from those around you. And you can bring in there, too, listening with understanding and empathy as well, that we are in a civil society, and it's super important in today's you know, political climate, social climate, to listen really carefully. And it can be a very vulnerable moment to share that so the more you can lead that as the instructor or even have you know if there's a student who's taking your course before looking to them i mean you jace you've taken a lot of courses with us so we of course look to you for everything that's there <laughs> but having that student share that as well i think is super important i love that ex that example thank you for sharing that others ravi Um, so first of all, thank you. This was a really thought-provoking and very useful presentation. I learned a lot, and whatever department you work for is, is very lucky to have you. It's the best uh, department. Yeah. <laughs> That's Are great to hear. That's it for five years. So I, I was thinking about number 10, gathering data through all, all your senses. and. Um, when I teach Introduction to Religious Studies, which is our World Religions course uh, in person, also around 100 students, or um, and a, a Breath Humanities course, or else my Introduction to Hinduism course, which is a DHA course, um, about 40 students or so, with each of them I have students choose a place of worship to visit. And, and, and during the pandemic, this was switched to a Zoom conversation with a practitioner of a tradition. And I, I intentionally asked them to experience the situation more than just through their eyes or through their ears, but really kind of give me a sense of, of, of everything they're experiencing. But what was exciting to me is looking at number eight and thinking about how it would be very fruitful to combine that with 10, where possibly I could ask them to begin their essays by talking about first what they brought into the situation, right? So what were your preconceived notions about what you were going to see when you visited this mosque or when you visited this temple or whatever? Um, what were you expecting to see? And then what happened to you as you experienced that, right? So there's, there's that applying the past knowledge. And some students come in with a lot of knowledge. They've had friends from that tradition. They've they visited before and others don't have any. And so it was exciting to try to think about how I could possibly combine more than one of these to enhance an assignment. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that, Robbie. I think that's a great example of how these aren't all independent. They can be built on 
together. Does anybody else want to share? Yeah. Michael, is that your name? Uh -huh. Okay, great. <laughs> Uh, hi everyone. Yep, my name is Michael. I'll be teaching in the English department as a lecturer, so teaching some of these general education 1010 courses. And um, one, uh, I just recently came from teaching college success courses, and so one of like my favorite pieces of that was like this idea of like exit tickets and like that kind of metacognitive development and that five thinking about your thinking. But it made me think now, like um, since there's kind of more. Mm, I guess consistency in like the rhetorical sense of teaching writing like what can I do with those exit tickets from like class to class like especially if I try to emphasize like questions so like what can I do with like like you know for example let's say at the end of an activity there's like a sentence starter is like one question I still have about x subject is and then like bringing those back the next class and either me doing something with them and like you know uh, making observations on that or maybe putting it back in the students hands like uh, uh, like encouraging them to be resources for each other or something like that is is what came to my mind so so that's what I was thinking like how can I be more purposeful with using the questions students generate yeah I think that's a great idea especially in terms of having students ask each other because you're also creating a sense of a learning community there, especially in some of these classes where people don't know each other as well. It's by simply saying, turn to your neighbor and ask them what they did on this. That can be a really big spark to creating a friend and other things like that. All right, so I think that we are out of time, but we wanted to talk a little bit about, um, first of all, if you on the back side of your handout are the list of all of the assignments that we have made, the absolutely beautiful thing about Canvas is that we can send any of these to you super easily from Canvas. So if there is one that you think, hey, that could be great, I want to see what they did, or all of them, just let us know and we're happy to send that over to you for you to use, to remix for your own use. I think remixing in education is super important, so you know, please do reach out to us with that. We are also putting together a, a book through the ETE Open Book Series with USU Press called Habits of Mind, Designing Courses for Student Success. We are currently looking at, uh, I guess, abstracts that are there for that. And so hopefully we'll have this out by next time, um, this time next year, that is there. So, all right, well, thank you everybody for coming. It was a pleasure to get to share this framework with you and to try to get some creative juices flowing. Appreciate it.